This is Steve Harris from Live Maiden and British Lion. You're listening to Andrew McCasebit from Scars and Guitars. G'day everybody, welcome to the show. I've got a chat with my mate from Indianapolis to share with you. It's Robert Saylor and this time around he's talking about his new book, Death to the World and Apocalyptic Theological Aesthetics. Now Robert, some of you tuned into the last chat. Robert is a theologian, author and scholar amongst many other titles which I'll list in the episode description. Throughout this conversation, he talks about his book, so we dive into the movement that is Death of the World's impact on orthodox structures, its critique on modernity, and its apocalyptic themes, amongst many other engaging topics. Now, the first 10 minutes or so of the chat are Robert and I becoming reacquainted with each other, but there's enough relevant topics throughout that part of the episode for me to keep it intact with the rest of it. So here he is, Robert Saylor. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Robert. How you going? Not bad, man. How are you? Good to see you again. Yeah, likewise, mate. Uh, great to catch up again. I've been looking forward to this one again. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah. How's everything been going? How are your studies and all that? They're going really well. It's uh, it's it's a different type of... So so it's uh, theological perspectives on mental health, which informs my... Uh, which is a unit in my... Uh, study to obtain uh, a postgrad in uh, a certificate of divinity is what it is so okay. i'm taking it in stages okay so i'm going to do the postgrad certificate then the postgrad diploma then the masters it'll be nine years or ten years or what have you but what else have you- <laughs> i'm right <laughs> i uh man i'm not one to talk <laughs> i've been at this for a while and uh it's it keeps going yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's very different to journalism, as you can appreciate. Journalism is all about doing this sort of stuff and using the cameras and the videos and Premiere Pro and the Adobe Suite and all the rest of it. So it's a bit of a change. I haven't had as much heavy essay writing and reflection writing as what I uh, need to do here. And there's a ton of reading, as you can appreciate. But it's look, it's informing my my opinion, and that's the whole perspective. That my perspective on on studying is and education is that. It just gives you a, a it gives you a deeper deeper knowledge to use in your everyday. It's not just about having a hard skill set that you use right. slightly to become an engineer or what have you. One of the things I really noticed, especially as I've gotten older, is that like the people who seem most alive, the people who seem most like dialed into life, they they're curious about something and they're learning about something. Like the people I know that are just kind of walking through life, kind of dull and numb and so on they're just not curious about anything anymore they're not they're not learning and uh so yeah i think finding something that you know excites that curiosity and gives you a chance to indulge it that's a huge part of just staying staying awake and staying alive in life that's so true yeah that's the uh it's not a cheat code exactly but that's the method that i've i've found that i i i'm not saying i'm old you know i say this a fair bit on the show but i'm 46 so i'm not suggesting for a minute that i'm approaching older age or what have you but just think back say 30 years ago to when in our youth and we look at, even looking at photos of our parents back then when they were even younger in their mid-30s or late 30s they look older than us now yeah yeah that's i think you're right in a lot of cases and yeah, I think some of that does have to do with, you know, if we so choose, we have access to yeah. things that just weren't a possibility, you know, a generation ago. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, look, I, I've made it, making a determined effort. I'm singing a lot more in the band. I don't know whether I'm, I've got what it takes to be a front man yet, but I'm certainly doing a lot of the singing at the moment, still playing a basing, well, bass primarily, and uh, playing the acoustic guitar with it. But as long as you, you're always going toward something which is building out some type of skill set in your life i believe that that's that's just something just keep on putting one foot foot in front of the other and especially i, I might have shared this with you last time but i don't drink these days as well so mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's no friday night beverages or what have you so you, you do you you find yourself with all this time and energy to devote to something and it's got to go somewhere right absolutely yeah and you know it's in terms of like engaging a craft, you know, you're talking about leaning more into singing and so on. One thing that I've really noticed is that the the people that I consider to be like absolute masters of their craft, I'm thinking about like great 
I've been fortunate to meet some great composers, you know, like Arvo Parrish and so on, you know, sort of at the top of their game. Um, you know, great artists, thinkers, that sort of thing. They tend to be the most humble. The yeah. people that are really arrogant, in my experience, they're like the A minus, B plus, <laughs> and below kinds of artists. Absolutely. And the, the true, and I think part of that is because for those that really do have kind of either a genius about it naturally or who have the purity of having devoted themselves to the craft, they see the sheer size of the thing. Yeah, it's humbling yeah. in the in the best possible way. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like I think Arvo Parrott or, you know, uh, you know, some great novelists or so on, they see the sheer size of music. They see the sheer size of literature. Yeah. And that is a kind of humanizing humility. I so I'm all for like the devotion to craft that as formation, yeah. really. Yeah, it's so true what you say. The other thing I find about really smart people, I'm drawn to my time at Bond when I was at, at university, and uh Jeff Brand is just a he's a genius and uh just a tremendous fella as well. But he had a way because because he, of his level of intellect, Thank you. he had a way of talking to you and making you feel smart. Because uh, yeah. that's what I find really smart people can do. They can involve you in a conversation at an intellectual level and draw on your strengths without you realizing it to contribute to the to the topic. You're so right. Yeah, yeah. And it's right because it's a kind of if you don't have that, then there's a sort of anxiety to like, oh, yeah. I've got to establish dominance. I've got to establish my credentials. <laughs> if you if you have the skill to where you're not anxious about it, it's almost like martial arts, right? They say like the truly great martial artists are the ones that are able not to fight, right? Because it's oh. like because they know, you know, <laughs> it's like no, I don't have to establish this dominance. I know I can do it, so therefore I don't have to. Instead, we're going to have a, a, a better kind of encounter. I think that's what you're. That's a version of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and and look on look on the topic of excellence, and without blowing too much smoke up your ass, excuse the excuse the Australian vernacular. But uh, nice. an outstanding book, mate. I, I thoroughly oh, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I I think it 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 certainly hit me at an academic level. Whether that's the intention or not, we'll explore through the conversation. But I found that I had to pay attention to the book. It wasn't one of those things I could read as I was going to bed and the way you do a novel or what have you. I had to really focus and and give it give it my intellectual attention in order for me to understand it. Because a lot of the topics it's not that they're foreign. But they're not part of my existing wheelhouse. Sure. Okay, so I didn't before we spoke. I didn't know anything about Death of the World, and uh, you're you're my real you're my only real interface with, uh, with with the Orthodox denomination. So I might kick things on from the perspective about asking you about the book. So this is what I understand that the thesis examines. So Death of the World, it's a movement of uh, it's a blend of punk rock culture and Orthodox spirituality, mm -hmm. and. Um, Throughout the book, you're offering insights into contemporary uh, U.S. orthodoxy as well as comparis comparisons to death to the world. But look, you also you, you're exploring the impact on ecclesial uh, ecclesial structures, consumerism, uh, anti modernistic rhetoric. I, I enjoyed reading that aspect of it. I must say, um, and you were highlighting the role of these things in orthodoxy. Now that that was what very broadly, just high level, you know, just to open the conversation. That's what I took from it, in terms of my understanding of it, is at a very high level. But does that does that resonate, and is that a decent way to introduce the book to an audience? I think so. Though, yeah, I mean, it started off years ago. I mean, I've probably been at this for about five years now, and mm -hmm. I I came into it. You know, I'd, I'd written a lot on religion and music. You know, I did the book on Radiohead. You know, and I came up in. I came up in punk rock culture in the small town that I grew up in. Yeah. Uh, I want to say that with a little caution, because if anybody from my hometown who was in the scene <laughs> is hearing this, it's like, oh, oh, Rob, he was, he was like, he was the guy in the back, he was the guy in the corner, and I was. <laughs> I'm not saying I was like central in the scene or anything, but I went to a lot of shows, you know, um, and it really, and I think more importantly, it kind of struck a chord with me in terms of um, identity and that kind of thing. So I found out about Justin Marler, uh, this guy who was the guitarist for Sleep on Sleep's first album, Volume One, uh, left after the first album, 
on sort of a spiritual odyssey, found himself at this Orthodox monastery. In, uh, and I've been to the monastery, and it is remote. It was even more remote in his day in the 90s. Uh, mountaintop in California, no cell phone reception. Mm. Uh, and when he's at the monastery, the abbot says, okay, uh, given that you come from punk rock culture, metal culture, and all that, how do you, how do we do outreach back into the culture? And the outreach that he was interested in was not so much like a, it wasn't so much like an evangelism kind of thing saying, oh, how do we like convert people to orthodoxy? It was more about, you know, a lot of kids in the culture are struggling, you know, with drugs, depression, suicide, that sort of thing. How do we, how do we speak a word into that? And, you know, this is the early nineties. So, so Marler was like, well, I mean, the, the currency of the age really is zines, you know, especially mm -hmm. the punk rock scene. So they start this zine called Death to the World. And the what I try to do in the book is to tell the story of the success of Death to the World, the influence of Death to the World, but also as it relates to some of the stuff that you were just talking about in terms of why is it that this zine, which features really intense images of monks, you know, and monks holding skulls and the kind of death imagery that you get in parts of orthodoxy. Why did that speak so effectively to so many, to so many people? And then now that it's been revived in the last few years toward, in an internet age, how does that sort of aesthetic, that kind of melding of punk rock metal aesthetic with orthodoxy, how does that travel around in an internet age and what does it speak to? That's what I'm trying to get at in the book. Yeah. The, I can talk about five years there. The amount of research is, is incredible that you put into this. So what, was there anything unexpected or any challenges that, oh, of course there would have been. So what, what were the, those challenges or the unexpected issues that you encountered? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think it was probably the first book I've written where I was, yeah, I'm a scholar, right? You know, but at the same time, to do this kind of research, you do form relationships with people. Um, you know, and I went through all the normal university procedures, IRB, that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, I was very aware of the fact that I was writing about not only about living people, you know, and, and it's different to write about scholars where you sort of, as a scholar, you sort of expect, oh, other people are going to be critiquing my work, that kind of thing. Uh, this was more engaging, I don't know, people at an existential level, like stuff that was really life and death, is really life and death to them. And so I think the thing that surprised me the most was that, you know, even when people would talk about, say, the government in ways that I didn't particularly resonate with, or you know, yeah. some of the some of the conspiracy theory stuff that I get into later in the book. It's yeah. like this isn't coming from a place of craziness, and it's not coming from a place of evil or anything like that. It's like the the world's a really strange place, and all of us are trying to figure out our how to get our bearings in it. So I came I came away. I'll put it this way. I think the biggest surprise is that I came away from talking to people that I disagree with, with more affection for, and, and sort of more uh, respect for yeah. how it is that they engage the world. And respect and affection is not the same as agreement at the end of the day, but, I, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for all of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm really glad you, you bring that up because I, I, I found that to be the most compelling aspect of the book. Okay. So because the zine is very critical of Marxism and postmodern postulations, and you make many observations to your point on the topic throughout the book. And look, given given postmodernism is obsessed with the idea that truth is not universal, instead it's individual. So, so again, after all of your your research, do you believe that subversive to topics that would be broadly called, say, conspiracy theory or what have you? Are they inextric here's the key point. Are they inextricably bound to the death to the world movement, do you think? Yeah, I think that's a I mean, you've you've put your finger on it. That is the question. I think death I think the death to the world movement is at a crossroads. And I think that that crossroads is reflective of a kind of broader crossroads that a lot of religion and spirituality is at. Here's and the way I think I would put it right now today is this. 
one of the things that spirituality, you know, religion does is to teach you to look at the world and to say that the world as it appears is not necessarily the deepest truth of the world. In other words, there's something underneath the surface. There's some kind of truth that is, um, that requires eyes to see it. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about conspiracy theory, it's pretty similar, right? It says, oh, the story as we get it, the main narrative is not the real truth. You have to dig underneath it. So yeah. I think there are a lot of natural uh, resemblances and resonances between a uh, spiritual formation and formation in conspiracy theory. I think for both of them, at the end of the day, the question becomes, you know, what is the fruit of that? Is the fruit of that that you become sort of more curious, more open, not open in the sense of no boundaries or, you know, there's no such thing as truth, but open in the sense of, wow, truth is really complex. I need to continue to learn more and more facets of it. Or does it close you off, put you into a defensive isolationist posture to well, say, okay, I distrust more and more of the world. I distrust more and more people. Um, you know, in some ways, to put it in theological terms, I think it's the difference between like kind of a Gnostic point of view that says, oh, truth is only the sole province of a few mm -hmm. gifted individuals and everyone else is an outsider versus what I took to be the orthodox, you know, small o, orthodox early church insistence saying, well, no, there are a lot of depths to truth, but at the end of the day, truth should draw us closer together. It should draw us more and more into human community so that's a long way of answering the question but that's just to say i don't think it's a matter of saying oh the movement needs to totally get rid of conspiracy theory type engagements with the world i think the question becomes what is the outcome of what it means to be to take that kind of punk rock energy of being skeptical of being questioning you know where do you where do you point that energy and what is the result uh, does that make sense yeah, it, it does. But I, I also, I have to mention that you, you did write, or you have written that uh, apocalyptic, or I'll, I'll, we'll get to apocalyptic eventually, but I'll just mention it now, the, that apocalyptic and conspiratorial, conspiratorial themes are just on the topic, permeate through US orthodoxy. Now, because yeah, I know next to nothing about US orthodoxy, is it not fair for like the lay reader, someone like me to make, uh, draw a conclusion that death of the world merely reflects what's going on in US orthodoxy? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think, I mean, it's a it's an interplay, right? I think death to the world in some ways has been a catalyst for some quarters of U.S. orthodoxy to engage deeper in conspiracy theory. And some of, part of what I talk about in the book is you saw that, for instance, around uh, you know the pandemic, right, COVID nineteen, and responses to that. Um, you see that in terms of reactions to what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, in in terms yep. of okay, who are who are the spiritual guardians here? What is the what does it mean for a yeah, country it's, to it's stay? Yeah, it's important for that, isn't it? Because the Orthodox Church yeah. is, is right in it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're we're talking about the the largest demographically the largest Orthodox Church in the world, the Moscow uh, Patriarchate, going up against a, a very sizable uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine, and there are all sorts of um, you know, for those who sort of dig around in the news, there are all sorts of ecclesial politics alongside the geopolitics yeah. there. I think um, I think it's the case that even though Orthodox in the U.S. are a relatively small part of the population, they are, um, you know, to put it in statistical terms, they're overrepresented in terms of participation in what we might call conspiracy theory. Yeah. And, you know, as you saw in the book, I, I try to wrestle with, okay, what do we even mean when we say conspiracy theory? Yeah, you know, I like one, the way you one, did that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, one man's conspiracy theory is another man's just truth, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's how do we how do we adjudicate that? But I think you're I think you're right that part of what I'm getting out of the book is to say death to the world is not only reflects, but in some ways gives us insight into why the kinds of formation that would make someone a pretty devout Orthodox in this context, again, are kind of similar to the kinds of 
you know, to put it in philosophical terms, the sort of epistemological formations, the kind of ways of viewing the world that we associate with conspiracy theory. So I think they are, there yeah. are some natural affinities there. So, so the first part of the, I, I mentioned apocalyptic, so I'm going to talk about that now. Um, to what extent, or is it at all? Now, I, I, again, I, I'm only going by what I've read, and I've only read the book once, and I think it requires another read. So I'm going to look forward to reading it again in a couple of months' time. But the movement itself is inspired by, uh, you know, my choice of words here, the yet-to-be-sanctified patron saint, uh, Seraphim Rose. Okay? I don't know. So his outlook seems to be fairly apocalyptic. So Absolutely. It, is the yeah so you can probably see where I'm headed, which is that is the apocalyptic theme, if you like, associated with death of the world, is it more of an artifact of Seraphim Rose than it is orthodoxy? I think I think if you walk into the I'm gonna say the average Orthodox parish in the United States, particularly uh what we think of as the ethnic parishes, so like Greek Orthodox parishes, you know, Antiochian, more Middle East Orthodox parishes, you're not going to get a whole lot of apocalyptic. It, in other words, yes, this particular emphasis upon apocalyptic and otherworldliness and the, not, and the idea that history is getting worse and worse and is headed yeah. towards, yep. uh, kind of, well, the advent of the Antichrist and sort of the rise of the Antichrist and so on, that is a particular kind of melding of orthodox content with something that I would argue is more characteristically American. And you you see that in like Hal Lindsey, you know, like late great planet Earth, a lot of the 1970s and 80s evangelicalism has a pretty apocalyptic tone. So yeah, someone like Father Seraphim Rose, you know, in the... Um, mid to later 20th century it's tricky because it's it's not a, it's not clear how much of that he actually read but it it was in the air and what he does in a lot of his writings is to take pretty deep knowledge of historic orthodox sources and meld it with this apocalyptic worldview you know and he's reading Nietzsche he's reading Dostoevsky so there's this really intense kind of yep. existential bent to it He's also thinking about the recent history of Russia in which, you know, under the Soviets and so on, under Stalinism, Leninism, you know, potentially upwards of millions of Orthodox Christians and priests were persecuted, martyred, and so on. Yeah. So, so he's looking at the world and he's saying, oh yeah, when politics goes deeply wrong, as he saw it going wrong in you know, Bolshevism and so on. Yeah, yeah. The church suffers, and that is, and that corresponds to this idea that history is getting worse and worse, and it's moving towards this cosmic confrontation between good and evil. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. Hold that thought. I'm just going to ask a question about the Ro the Romanovs and uh, the Tsarism. I think oh, I'm going up on memory here again. I haven't written this bit down, but um, orthodoxy or um. Sarah from Rose, are they more so by their by their nature? Oh no, let's focus on Sarah from Rose. Is by by his nature is he anti Bolshevik? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's an icon of Tsar Nicholas who's a saint within Russian Orthodoxy. There's a there's an icon of Tsar Nicholas III at uh, the monastery where yeah. um uh -huh. yeah where uh, in Platino where. That where might Rose inspire. Was, did, you, did you draw a conclusion that might inspire some of the apocalyptic, uh, uh, you know, the apocalyptic view because of what happened to the Romanovs and, you know, the absolutely, whole... yeah. Look, if and and I think it explains, you know, I I suggest in the book, I think it explains why. Look, when the pandemic comes about and churches are being closed down, if you're spending lots and lots of time with your eyes on, you know, Russia. <laughs> in the you know in the 19th into the 20th centuries and you're looking at this notion of governments coming together and to um censure and persecute christians it's kind of understandable that you would look then at your own context and say oh look the government forces are marshalling and they're they're mm -hmm. not allowing churches to do what churches are supposed to do again personally i that's not how i View what's what's happening in the pandemic, but what I'm trying to say in the book is that 
you know, it, it goes pretty deep into orthodox theology. It's kind of our theology of the icon that what you spend the most time staring at is going to form you, right? And the reason why we orthodox stare at, at, at saints and at biblical images in icons is because we think that you eventually become more like what it is you spend most of your time looking at. Um, you know, flip side, I guess is true, right? You know, you can, if you spend most of your time looking at hardcore pornography, you know, that's going to form you in a certain way. Right. <laughs> and so, um, if, if people are really have their eyes on this kind of persecution narrative that is tied to the governments and that has in back of it, in the case of the Bolsheviks, like atheism, right. And like anti-religion. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Then the, then when you take that formation and you turn it to the world as it is around you, you're going to see things a certain way. Um, and so I think that to, to get back to your original question, this is not necessarily mainstream orthodoxy in the United States, yeah. but I think when people talk about the character of orthodoxy in the United States, a lot of people are surprised by the strength and intensity of that kind of apocalyptic currents. And one of the things I'm trying to say in the book is, you know, it, it shouldn't be that much of a surprise if you look at where some of the real sources of vitality, particularly converts coming into the church, like, you know, like myself, right? Yeah. Uh, what are they? What are they reading? What are they bringing into it? And and someone like Rose is really providing a template for uh, being able to take that kind of apocalyptic energy and use it to make sense of the world around us. What's the view of Rose in, in the church hierarchy? That's a great question. Uh, there are it's it's very split. There are some within the church hierarchy, and I think particularly those with an eye to the ground in the United States, who um, have a lot of have a lot of respect for him, have reverence for him. Uh, his the case for his canonization has been taken up actually by the Georgian Church, okay. uh, you know, the country of Georgia. Yeah. But there are major supporters of that in the United States. That said, I would say the majority of i'm going to say like greek um sort of the more demographically numerous orthodox in the, the united Rankin states Saul. yeah yeah either have never heard of him or regard him as kind of an eccentric living up on a mountain who wrote some strange things about you know toll houses and that kind of thing so yep. his reputation so uh, when i talk about rose in academic circles in orthodoxy uh, a lot of times I get sort of puzzled stares. It's like, okay, he wasn't a, th he wasn't a theologian teaching at a university. He wasn't a bishop, you know, he wasn't someone with status, uh, yeah. in the normal ways that Orthodox figures get status. Uh, however, I would say for people who are sort of clued into a lot of the on the ground dynamics in American Orthodoxy, they hear Rose and it's like, oh yeah, he is the, he's kind of the font. He's the template for a lot of this energy that we're seeing. Yeah. Well, he, he's, okay, so I'm going to frame this as a question, but you can probably see what my view is on this after reading your book, which is that, is there a case to be made that a significant minority, which might even be in the majority if we profile youth, so people underneath the age of 30, that have con they converted to orthodoxy through the death to the world movement or through contact with the death to the world movement. Yeah, yeah I think so. I think, I think if you, um, right now there are all sorts of studies of, um, what people are calling, uh, a surge in, uh, converts into the Orthodox church in America. And I've worked with some, uh, I did, I do some demographic statistic stuff on the side and but I've worked with some, mm -hmm. um, church bodies to try to do surveys and studies of, okay, what is it that they're reading? What is it that they're engaging? And what they tend to be engaging, and this gets this gets to the, this is another important aspect to this point. Culturally, in all sorts of ways, we are moving away from what I would call celebrity culture into something more like influencer culture. I see this even with my it's, kids. My kids are sort of aware of celebrities, like, you know, movie stars, you know, rock stars, that sort of thing. They're very aware of online influencers, like TikTok stars, YouTube, 
yeah. folks. Like that's right. that's what they're spending a lot of their time consuming. And if you think about it, celebrity culture is kind of conservative. And what I mean by that is there are very specific channels by which you become a movie star. There are very specific channels by which you become a, a rock star, influential musician, right? Mm -hmm. However, influencer culture, you know, hopping on TikTok, hopping on YouTube, hopping on Substack and building up your audience that way, that is far more, that is far less regulated, right? That is far less, it's kind of the Wild West in terms of how people make it there. The, re the analogy then that I would draw is that if you think about the church, you've got your structures of classic influence and authority, right? You can become a priest, you can become a PhD academic teaching at a university or seminary. In yeah. other words, there are these recognized modes of authority, but then you could also be someone who hops on the internet, has charisma, has an ability to, t to tap into something, and all of a sudden your voice is far more influential for folks than the voices that are coming out of these more established channels. My point being that when you look at a lot of people that are converting to orthodoxy now, especially uh, men it, it, of you know like forty five and under, and, and you and you ask them, okay, how did you become aware of orthodoxy? What were you getting into? What were you engaging? A much higher percentage of them are are naming influencers, orthodox influencers, oh, and a lot yeah. of those influencers are throwing up the death to the world hashtag. A lot of them are talking about Seraphim Rose. A lot of them are talking about the rise of the Antichrist or the rise of the New World Order. So um, absolutely, with to the extent that we're seeing this convert surge in the United States, a high percentage of them seem to be um, not only consuming, but kind of participating, metabolizing and this um, more apocalyptic outlook it sounds like orthodoxy is a lot more nimble as a denomination compared to say the the mass of the catholic church and it can take advantage of influences is that is that a decent read on things yeah i i, I really appreciate you saying that because i think uh for myself and some of my um other friends that are writing on orthodoxy in the u.s i think part of what we're trying to get past is this image of orthodoxy is which, which to be fair orthodoxy often tries to give this image of itself right it tries to say oh we are unchanging we are you know every no surprises you know no <laughs> like, you know you come in you know exactly what you're getting we're unchanging and i mean it's not the it's not that there's no truth to some of that, but absolutely, when it comes to how this actually gets lived out, this is dynamic. This is evolving. This It's impacted by um, everything that's happening in the culture. And yeah, actually, as a religion scholar, that's what actually gets me really excited is when we take these you know, the book you saw, I, I sometimes talk about it as like energies, right? You take you take these energies that come from, okay, yeah, we're solidly rooted in this ancient tradition, but then you've also got this like energy coming out of punk rock, right? Like, you know, yeah. question everything, you know, go, go against the system. You would think that those two things would be at odds, but what happens when they actually come together and it's like, oh yeah, it's going to be F the system, yeah. But the method of the method of doing that is actually to draw upon these ancient religious themes and cool. and, and the sense of truth that you get in orthodoxy. That mm -hmm. I think is what is so powerful about Death to the World for and as I say in the book, I'm a fan. Like, you know, I I, I offer some criticisms or and some cautions about some aspects of what I'm seeing, but I, I think the death to the world impulse really does put its finger on something that, and the way I would describe it might be, look, you know, if you go all the way back to the ancient church at the time of the conversion of Constantine, and, you know, all of a sudden Christians go from being a persecuted marginal population to being right at the center of Roman imperial power. Here. What do, what do a lot of Christians start doing? They, they leave the city and they go out in the desert. They become they become desert monks. Right. Why? Because it's like, oh, it's too <laughs> it's too easy to be a Christian in the city now. 
we have we it. have it we have it too good we've got to go out and reclaim this sort of aesthetic vision that is against all of the systems that up until recently the church recognized i'm talking about like the roman empire here yep. the church recognized as being really unjust and problematic and i think death to the world picks up on that same kind of energy i think it picks up on that same and and i think that i think that impulse it's not that every single Christian is called to do that, but I, I think Christianity throughout time has always benefited from those who are willing to have that impulse to say, no, we're going to, we're getting too comfortable here. Yeah. We got to have at least some people that are willing to go out in the desert. Absolutely. Yeah. Great point. Mm -hmm. And look, uh, another point is uh, after all of your research, how would you respond to an observation, which might even be a criticism, that the movement, so Death to the World, presents too narrow a view of orthodox, and the key point here is the orthodox spirituality. I think that's a, I think that if someone only sticks with Death to the World, then that's absolutely right. You know, the, I think the very first line of the book, and it was, I was talking to Father John Valadez, who's the priest that runs yeah. the movement now. And I remember uh, I was sitting having lunch with him in uh, California where he's a priest. And he, he said, you know, we print in black and white in order to teach people to see color. And, you know, he said that, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what he meant. But the more we talked, the more I realized okay, in a way, he's saying that the the zine and the movement are designed to speak to people who have been living in this punk rock metal aesthetic, you know, skulls, darkness, death, that sort of thing. Yeah. It sort of draws them in. And then I think in his vision, it's like, okay, and then you get all of the rest of the treasury of Orthodox spirituality. You get, <laughs> um, you know, the... the the vibrancy, you know, it's Orthodox worship is a total multi-sensory experience. And to your point, Orthodox spirituality encompasses all sorts of things. It encompasses um, mystical theology, you know, on down the line. Yeah, that said, the what I would the flip side to that is that it's not just that death to the world is somehow kind of like a gateway drug. And then once you're in, you sort of automatically get the whole thing. Yeah. Sometimes the entry point ends up determining the experience once you're inside. So I do think that the death to the world aesthetic is, it does persist in the spirituality of a lot of people that come into orthodoxy on the basis of it. And that I think is somewhat transforming even what it means to say orthodox spirituality at least in the united states so it's a so it's kind of a both end and i think that absolutely i think some of my friends uh you know people i really respect who know orthodoxy yeah. they would look at death to the world and say look if this if this persists if this becomes the main orientation of someone towards orthodoxy then that is too limiting a vision the flip side to that, I think, would be it's sort of the classic convert versus cradle thing, right? I think yeah. some people who come in with the intensity of like a death to the world yeah. frame, they're going to look at some cradle orthodox and say, "Ah, you're, you're, you're not, you're not intense enough. You're not serious enough." I don't think that's a fair critique at all, but I think that you always get those dynamics when you, in terms of convert versus cradle stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah. It does, and and throughout the book, um, and, I, and I hope this is a good segue. But I, I love the way you, you frame the the, and I'm going to call it a tactic, bait the switch. You use that a fair bit. Yeah. So can you share can you share with people what what you mean by that? And and it's it's certainly been something it's something that people have criticised. I think death to the world about, isn't it? it haven't they? I think so, and I think what they're I think what they're looking at is, and there are lots and lots of analogies with this. I think especially within American evangelicalism, look if you think about like Christian rock or like um, 
<laughs> you know, yeah, right. or um, yeah. There's a whole, yeah, there's a whole other conversation there. I get yeah. into that in my Radiohead book actually about you know when did Christian, <laughs> when did Christian become a way of saying okay, lower your expectations about the quality <laughs> of what you're about to engage, right? Because <laughs> um, there's a history there. But yeah, there there's definitely, and I grew up, you know, I grew up in sort of a Bible Belt. Um, Midwest, and I saw this a lot growing up. It's like, oh yeah, let's hook the kids in. Let's like do rap music and worship, and then you know the theory is they'll come for the rap music, and then they'll then they'll get the gospel, and then they'll become you know and for the rap tr- side for the gospel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And and that is the classic sort of bait and switch. And yeah. and that just I think there's all sorts of reasons to be skeptical about that and and so yeah that's it's a really important point you're raising because i think a lot of people especially if they're formed in that kind of evangelical mindset or if they grew up around it they look at death to the world and it's like oh that's just the same old thing it's just the orthodox version of that you know hook them in with the with the punk rock and then and then once they're in yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. and i don't even even with what I just said about, you know, the whole sort of, you know, we we print in black and white so that people can see color. You know, there have been times where Father Valdez has said, Father John has said, oh, it's, it's kind of like bait on a hook. So I think that definitely is in the mix. That said, I would again go back to, well, but some people come in and even once they're in fully, even once they're full on orthodox, they keep this thing going and they build on it. I mean, another thing I, I talk about in the book is it's not just death to the world anymore, right? There are a lot of people, there are a lot of artists, Orthodox artists that have been inspired by death to the world. And so, um, you know, my friend Christian Grimm, who runs a thing called 13th Vigil, if you go on 13th Vigil, you're going to see um, T-shirts and clothing that melds Orthodox yeah. theology with metal stuff. Uh there's a uh, there's a book there's a bookshop out in California, punks and monks. There's um, there's all sorts of there are all sorts of folks in the Orthodox Church now that are taking the dust of the world thing and running with it, which is one of the reasons why I talk about it as a movement, not just like a a single zine or a single website or so on. Mm. So so anyway, to your point, it's like yeah, some people might look at it and say, oh, it's just that same old bait and switch. But I think if you actually look at what's happening once these folks come into the church, it's it's more interesting than that. It's more of a, well, what does it mean to actually put this kind of aesthetic in conversation with broader Orthodox spirituality and continue to explore what it means to meld the two? Hey. I, I'm drawn to my memory of when I was christened into the to the Krishna faith, Hare Krishna faith, and... Um, you go. It's a it's a very simple process, you know. There's a chant, and then there's there's a bit of a, a rite, and you get yeah, you're in basically. And um, one of the comments that was made to me were comments that was made to everybody that was present, which is that because they're speaking in another in another dialect, um, I'm not sure what it is now, um, but uh, so something that originates from the subcontinent anyway. So I, I can't understand any of it. Okay, but they said yeah. it, they said it doesn't matter that you can't understand any of it. These are words inspired by God. It's like honey. You don't have to understand how honey is made in order to enjoy it. Now, uh, to what extent do you think that that plays a role in, say, the Orthodox hierarchy giving their blessing to death to the world? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, by that's a different place to- theory. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a different place than I thought you were going with it, but I like where you I like where you went with it. Yeah. I the question the question of how sort of the hierarchy would interacts with the sort of currents of deaths of the world, it's an it's an interesting one. I mean, yeah. I I know that there are some within the hierarchy that are very concerned about um some of the more conspiratorial elements to it, you know, that I talk about in the book. <laughs> But I think there are also here's the here's the thing, especially in the United States as well as in parts of Europe, 
there's a kind of exoticizing of orthodoxy, what do I call a kind of Orientalism, right? It's like, um, oh, it's Eastern, it's mystical, it's, you know, it's this other, and we're going to we're gonna groove on it because it has this kind of yeah, otherness yeah. to it. I do think when I talk to when I talk to priests and bishops about death to the world, even if they're even if they're skeptical of it, I think they are also seeing this does seem to be tapping into something American, you know, they're um, maybe not exclusively American, but there's something about the way that um, Americans engage spirituality. And this seems to be to have its finger on some kind of pulse in terms of what that might mean for orthodoxy. Every, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out, okay, if there ever is an, um, a U.S. Orthodox Church, an American Orthodox Church, North American, the way that there is a Greek Orthodox Church, the way there's a Russian Orthodox Church, the way there's a Romanian Orthodox Church, what would that look like? Like, what would be the sort of signature elements uh, right now, as we speak, for instance, there's a conference, a second annual conference happening in the South, the Southern United States, the um, Bloodwell Conference, in which a lot of Orthodox folks, including some folks that I know are pretty influenced by Death to the World, they're right. coming together to talk about the relationship between Orthodoxy and U.S. Southern culture, you know, like Dixie culture, that kind of thing. Okay. And, uh, you know, and it's it's got that same thing where like some people would look at it and be like, oh, is that a mix of some problematic elements? Other people might look at it and say, no, that's what needs to happen. If the church is going to be alive in a given place, it needs to be in that kind of metabolic interaction with the culture around it. So, um, so yeah, I think that the world is one of several experiments that are happening in the United States right now hey. asking this question. Okay, to what extent is death to the world this other, or what? I'm sorry, to what extent is orthodoxy this other, and to what extent can it be um, not only inform U.S. culture but also vice versa? To what extent can the good elements in U.S. culture, whatever those are, be yeah. reflected in how churches lived out here? Um, but that being but that being said, you know, you brought up the critique of like the you know, the anti-modernism and so on. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of this energy is, I mean, here's a major difference between death to the world and a lot of what we look at as, as like Christian nationalism here in the United States. A lot of Christian nationalism in the United States sees the United U S culture as fundamentally good, fundamentally aligned with Christianity. And therefore the two need to get closer and closer together to be a Christian is to be a good American. To be a good American is to be Christian. Yeah. And we need to not only strengthen that up here, but we need to spread that around the world. That sort of classic Christian nationalism. The, the death the Orthodox stuff that I'm looking at is is more likely to say, look, a lot of US culture is fundamentally decadent. It's fundamentally flawed. It's not a it's not a matter of bringing the two closer together so that yeah. U.S. culture in its mainstream form can somehow influence the church. But again, that's where kind of the punk rock impulse comes in, right? Because what, is, what does punk rock say? It's like, yeah, mainstream culture is is messed up. You know, it's it's fake. It's phony. It's, prob it's ethically problematic. Right. Um, so I think another natural melding between a, what we might think of as a punk rock mentality and an orthodox mentality here in the United States is to it picks up on that energy again of saying, look, the mainstream that you see either on, you know, morning news or in a lot of U.S. Christian yeah. parishes, that's not the real story. The real story is this more underground thing. Well, yeah. Oh, man, so many great points there. You got my mind thinking. But I, I want to just before the, the, the you know, the thought the question escapes you. I've got to ask, because uh, Father John and Father Justin, have they read your book yet? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, So Justin has, uh, he's gone on Facebook and said he's really liked it. Um, I, mean, I could share that because he's been public about it. Right. Um, yeah. the, uh, I sent it to Father John. Uh, I He did, um, I did consult with him about the parts where I mentioned him directly. You know, I, again, I did the whole IRB thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard back from him yet. I don't know if he's gonna, um, here's, here's what I don't want to have happen. And I'm a little worried. I'd actually be curious about your take on this. Right. I, 
I don't want it to come off as, oh, old school death to the world was great. And then somehow in its revival, oh, that's when yeah. everything went yeah, south. Rock, yeah. I don't think it's nearly, I don't think it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't, oh man, I like the band's early stuff, yeah. but then they sold out. <laughs> I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be that kind of vibe. But, um, but you know, I, I do think that, I think it has more to do with like, as I say in the book, it has more to do with like an internet age, right? You know, a zine age yeah. where this stuff travels in, and as opposed to an internet age where all these different energies and all these different algorithms come together. But um, no, I've, I've, I've talked to Father John about it. And I said, look, you know, when I wrote my Radiohead books, I said, I really love this band. I think, <laughs> I think this album is less good than this other album but i'm saying that as a fan right i'm saying that as a nerd for the band but, but you I, I hope, correct when I hope you this book comes stuff, off and you're correct when you say the new stuff sucks but yeah, yeah. on that band no that's, a, that's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's like it's like uh you know i i hope it's like i want this to come off as fandom and as sort yeah. of music criticism in the positive sense like oh you know I, I dig on this vibe not this other one and um you know i i hope for those for those that really that like me are fans of the movement, um, whether they're fans of all of it, whether they have similar kinds of critiques, and I mean I talk to people on all ends of that spectrum. Yeah. I hope people read it and they're like, oh yeah, um, Rob really thinks that there's something cool happening here. Again, it's just kind of a caution around. Look, anything that's interesting these days, particularly in religion it's going to be swimming around in a lot of different waters and it's going to be drawing energy from a lot of different places. And some of those, some of those influences I think are positive and are, are ought to be encouraged. And others are, I think, draw energy from problematic places. And we just need to be cautious about that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I hope the book is read in that spirit. I, I, th I think so. It's, it's, as I say, I, I tend to view it more as an as an academic text, if you'll allow me to call it that. And from that perspective, uh, it's in, it's impeccably researched from an academic standpoint. I mean, the amount of referencing that you've, you've gone to the extent of, I mean, of course you have, because it's, as I say, it's a, I feel it's an academic text, but underneath mm -hmm. everything, it's almost, that's a book unto itself to actually go there and discover the various referencing that you've uh, You've researched and the like. So no, I it, look. You, you've been careful to make. Um, you've made what I would describe as uh, broadly speaking balanced arguments supported by. Supported by sources. Okay, so I, I don't Thank think you. so. I don't think so at all. It's it's something that look. You know, these things are always in the the eye of the the you know the mind of the reader in this case. Okay, so look. I, I did it just very quick story. I did an interview with Steve Harris of Iron Maiden recently. And oh, it, nice! It was the highlight of my podcasting career, as you can apart from, apart from this chat, of course. You know, so <laughs> of, course, of course, yeah, yeah. Me and Steve <laughs> Harris, right there. On the... yeah. <laughs> but nah, uh, man. but look, it, it's a bit like I've heard this of when you interview Metallica. The fair boys came after me, you know, and you get that, you know, yeah. You know, all the, all the regular listeners were just stoked for me, you know. The people who've been listening for years are just thrilled that I got the interview, and I got a lot of musicians who tapped into it and liked it as well. But mate, you get these these fanboys, these people that sit on the periphery, if you like, who aren't really participating, not musicians, just sort of music fans in inverted commas. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but wow, they had some rocks for me. And, uh, mate, the bottom line is I think, uh, you know, if you're keeping everybody happy, here's the key point. You're not doing your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. And I think, and yeah, and and too, like the way that something stays alive is by critical engagement with it. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it, it's a, you know, it's the old saying, but it's true. Like the only things that don't move are dead things, right? If it's alive, it's moving. If it's alive, it's changing and evolving and so on. Yeah. And so I think for people that really care about death to the world specifically, and then care about like the broader things that it's tapping into. Right. Um, I mean, look, I, I mean, just speaking really personally, I mean, this whole question of like, you know, how do you find hope amidst yeah, life itself amidst life as we encounter it in modernity, um, you know, it really, it really resonates with me. And I think, I think too, I think the other thing about death to the world that really speaks to me is that 
there's it messes up these dichotomies that we tend to make between like left and right, you know, progressive versus conservative yeah. and so on. Because I mean, I think at the end of the day, pretty much all of us, if we're paying attention, we're sitting here and we're saying there is a massive gap between the way the world ought to be and the way the world is, right? You right. know, and if you're a Christian believer like myself, you know, that ought is inspired by a vision of love, right? And intention. It's like God created the world to be a certain way. We were supposed to live a certain way and and we're not there. And and the consequences of us not being there are are horrific and heartbreaking. And 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 so this notion that look, we need to harness our faith, our belief, our our hope. And first and foremost, we need to find a, the kind of hope that gets us up in the morning and keeps us, you know, having kids and, <laughs> you know, sending them out yeah. into the world and, you know, all the, all the things we do in our daily life. But then also, in a broader sense, you know, speaking a word of truth into a hurting world, like that's, to me, that's not a left issue or right issue. That's not a progressive issue. That's a conservative issue. I mean, like anything else, it tends to fall out that way. But I, I, I hope people. I'm always looking for things where it's like, oh, this is tapping into something that is not not a kumbaya sort of unification. Like, oh, we can all get together, but more a sense of no. This actually speaks to something that is pretty hardwired into all of us and gets past a lot of the bullshit divisions that um okay. that I think keep us, frankly, from ever making progress on the other because it distracts us into the pleasures of the pleasures of oppositional politics which is junk food that's kind of pleasure <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah which is junk food right you know it's a it's it's yeah, it, it feels really good for a second and then you, then you feel awful afterwards it's terrible yeah i know so hey here's a question i've been wanting to ask you okay so yep so this is the first question that came to me when i finished the book okay yep to what extent do you think the apocalyptic and the anti-modernistic rhetoric of death to the world veers into nihilism? Yeah, yeah, no, that's um, that's a great, great question. And, and I mean, just for context, for those who you know, you've read the book, for those who have it, nihilism, this notion that you know there's a fundamental meaninglessness, is the great opposition. That's what death to the world sets itself against, right? It's mm. like, it's either truth or nihilism. That's the whole death to the world pitch. And so your question of, okay, given it's given how intensely it leans into this anti-modernist kind of rhetoric, does yep. it end up actually <laughs> reproducing well, the yeah, very thing that it sets itself life, against? To your point, to your really well-made point, we are, we, have, we are forced to lead this life of it's, it's a... It's next to impossible unless you join a monastery to go onto a hill or into a desert somewhere and not participate in life because we're not solitary creatures. So yeah, I just I, I, I don't know whether I don't know I haven't formed an opinion on that point, but I, that's why I thought it was important to ask. Yeah, well, I think it I, I mean it's I love the question. I think this it to me, it really correlates with, okay, if you think about someone that's a tried and true, punk rocker you know they're, they're in the life they're lifers they're in it all the authenticity there's a big difference between those we know that have channeled that into something into building something into something constructive versus those who just stay in the moment of negative energy right it's like if if one's whole punk rock existence is one giant like fuck you to the world as opposed to, I'm going to take all this anger, I'm going to take all this energy, but I'm going to build it towards, you know, whatever, you know, animal rights, um, right. you know, feeding the homeless, you know, like, you know, uh, Dorothy Day, you know, like <laughs> one of my, she's right behind me here, you know, um, <laughs> you know, she, <laughs> she was punk. I mean, I'm not trying to be cheesy, but I mean, she was, nope. she was out, she, you know, the Catholic worker movement. I mean, it was it was outside the mainstream and she was oppositional in a lot of ways, but she was channeling it towards, okay, we're gonna we're gonna feed people. We're gonna be hospitable to people that no one else wants to be hospitable to. We're gonna build things. So the analogy is 
if death to the world were to stay in the moment of, okay, when you think death to the world, you think anti, anti whatever, anti modernism, anti yeah. um, decadent culture, anti humanism, anti whatever. If it stays in that anti moment, then I think, Andrew, you're absolutely right. That's just going to collapse ultimately into, yeah, I, I think yeah. nihilism is not a bad word for it. It's got to be channeling what, whatever we're against that has to be ultimately yeah. overshadowed by what it is that we're for. What are, what are you keeping your eyes on most of the time? I've had friends that get into a lot of like online fights, for instance, yeah. and and I, I agree with them on paper, but I've actually found myself saying to people, it's like, dude, again, we become the thing that we stare at the most. Yeah. If you spend the vast majority of your time staring at all of these things which make you angry, and yeah. you spend all your time staring at your own posts being anti that, yeah, it's like you're you're actually becoming the thing. You're becoming the you know, Nietzsche said you 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 become the void that you stare into. It's yeah. like you gotta you gotta spend yeah, it's so more. True. The void stares back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. you've got to spend more time staring at the thing that you ultimately want to become and you want the world to become. And again, yeah. I think those two moments can go together. You can take that energy. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, Ian Mackay, you know, to me is this, right? Yeah, I mentioned him in the book. Yeah, yeah, huge influence on Justin Marler, their friends, you know. Oh, like, right. okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, that's what... I mean, he did that, right? Yeah, you get the... You get the fuck you moments with Fugazi and Minor Threat and so on, sure. But but that's not what you that's not what you remember them for, right? What you remember them for is like ethics, authenticity, like you know, what yep. what they stood for. And um so, so I don't think it's a matter of leaving that energy behind. I think it's a matter of taking it and building and channeling it towards the good. Again, like what the desert monks, the desert mothers and fathers did. Yeah. I think I think my opinion. I just said I haven't arrived at it, but I'm just going to share where I think it is at the moment. I think the Zine does a very good job of pointing out what's wrong, but also saying here's what's also right. So it's not a bait yeah. switch at all. It's just saying, hang on a sec, we're gonna we're gonna recognize what doesn't work because a lot of people are arriving at death to the world because they're fed up and they yeah. just, they feel that spiritual emptiness and they're clamoring for something a deeper meaning. So it gives them that confirmation. Yes, you f we feel the same way you do, but this is where we're headed. And I think this is. I think I I I think you painted that picture in the book sufficiently. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's right. And again, that's when I when I go back to saying you know I'm a fan of the thing. It, it's it's for that reason, right? You know, it's it's not just it's not just the anti moment. It's the look. And and you know I I've. I think I quote this in the book, but part of the reason I think death to the world speaks to people is that if you've really gone through the fire of watching all of the emptiness of modern promises, yeah, sort of burnt, you're not you're not going to fall for you're not going to fall for a superficial kind of hope, right? Well, you know, and I'm not. There's a lot of there's a lot of religion out there, even. And I, I sort of had this impulse since I was a kid. I'm not saying that that I was like super smart or insightful or anything, but it's like I was just formed in such a way that if someone is talking to me about hope and if it doesn't have some kind of grit to it, if it doesn't have some kind of bite to it, if it hasn't like been through the fire, yeah. it's just I'm like, no, nah, man, that's just it's a it's a nice thought that it's not going to it's not going to be tested. Yeah, in the market, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It, yeah, it's a it is a kind of battle scarred hope yeah that i think has any that has any chance of really um speaking a word into the pain that you know welcome to the desert of the real right people that have yeah. been through the desert of the real whether that's through stuff that happens in their childhood whether that's just you know um at, like right now i'm teaching a class on israel and gaza you know israel and palestine oh, and wow. um yeah so, you know and, and i mean we're yeah. de we're we're, we're in, I've got 12 students in that class and kind of as the class, we're wrestling with this, including myself as an instructor. It's like, okay, we're spending a lot of time. We're spending a lot of time reading about really horrible stuff, you know, on, on multiple sides. And it's very, 
however one ultimately feels about it. It's very complex, you know, not a lot of black and white. Um, and how do we stay human in the midst of that, right? Yeah. And that's not just for our own sort of, you know, self-care or emotional health. That's actually to do justice to the situation because there's always on the ground people that are working for peace. There are always, whether that's actual peace activism or whether that's people just getting up in the morning, brushing their teeth, feeding their kids and thinking, okay, we're going to make it through another day. That's, you know, if you're if you're in that kind of situation, even staying alive is, a, is an act of resistance. So, um, I don't know, like we can't, yeah, I'm going back to your question about nihilism. It's like, if we only stay in the moment of darkness, despair, the forces of evil are gathering, and we've just got to continually point that out. Not only are we going to be malformed by that, but you're actually, um, well, I think there was a poet that said, you know, if you don't actually talk about the beauty in the world, then you're ultimately praising the devil and not God. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're just spending all your time praising the devil's handiwork. Yeah, and you're not actually, and you're not actually noticing the spirit within. Well, I think I think that's just so crucial. Just focusing on, or just talking about the course that you're you're leading there, or the subject I should say that you're teaching there. How um. How quick are students ready to go into solution mode when this this topic of Israel and Gaza in your experience? I think uh, I think it's this spiritual discipline. I mean, I teach this this class is at a seminary, so I can say that. I think we're engaged in a spiritual discipline where we get a foothold on what a solution might look like. Then we read something, we engage something that kind of knocks it, <laughs> knocks us off that pedestal. It's like, yep. oh, it's not as simple as that. Then on the basis of having had that experience, we get back saying, okay, taking that into account, here's what that might look like. Um, and that process of, okay, we're looking for solutions. Oh, that solution is it's not as it's not necessarily going to fly because of XYZ complication. Okay. T start, take that into account. And it's not, the point is it's not going back to square one, right? Uh, there's that classic image of like, it looks, it feels like we're going around in circles, but it's actually a spiral, right? Yeah. It's like, we're going to, but we're, but we're gaining, we're going, we're going up towards yeah. wisdom. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure as heck not sitting here with this little, solution to israel palestine i'm not even entirely sure i would know what what that means yeah but i think that there are more humane accurate uh human ways to engage it and that and that depends upon knowledge i mean that's why i teach that's why i'm a scholar i don't think i don't think knowledge and facts are the only thing but you can't get to a deep appreciation of the world it's like it's like music criticism, right? Like, yeah, you don't need to be a music critic, or or what your Hari Krishna friends were saying to you about honey. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you can you can you can know, know nothing about honey, and it tastes good. Mm -hmm. But if you know a whole lot about bees, if you know a whole lot about like different regions and so yeah. on, you can become your, your kind of a honey connoisseur. Increase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. uh, you know, or Steve Harris's bass playing, right? You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> you can rock out, you can rock out <laughs> the Iron Maiden, but it's like, yeah, if you're a bass player and you're listening, it's like, oh man, this guy's, this is a genius. I mean, this is, um, yeah, exactly, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. Um, yeah. so I think it's, I think it's similar. One, one of the other things I really appreciated about the book is that, and and this is goes for you in general, and this is my perception anyway, is uh, I really appreciate that you're not ideologically motivated. Um, that you are asking a lot of questions and that you make observations. And I, I think I've framed a lot of my questions in that way for you because of that. But to, to what extent, especially within your teaching, uh, are you dealing with a lot of kids or when I say kids, you know, students, but I, I know I'm sort of answering my own question. I will answer my own question in part and say, because you're teaching in a seminary, you're going to deal with students of a certain intellect. So I doubt you're dealing with a lot of ideologically motivated students. But to what extent do you have to deal with that? Yeah, I teach uh, I teach undergrad uh, periodically at Indiana University as well. So I get I get the um yeah, the 18 and 19 year olds. Here's here's what I've seen. A lot of 
let's say kids, let's say like Gen Z ish, right. you know, um, they just have not had the kind of experience that made me want to be a, an academic that made me want to be a humanity scholar, which is sitting down over pizza or beer or whatever with a friend really hashing out a disagreement like two three hours like you're really going after it and you do not agree and they're giving their best points and you're giving your best points and you're getting intense about it and then at the end it's like man we are such better friends for that like i i, I could do this all day like i i love this i just had a great time and, and i feel like a, i feel better you know i feel like my arguments have been improved they haven't had that experience. It, the experience that they've had is, oh, if I disagree with someone, I'm going to get flamed. I'm going to get canceled. I'm going to get, yeah. um, you know, so the only people that I'm going to talk about my stuff with are going to be people that I know, <laughs> I you know, the algorithm, yeah. <laughs> online or otherwise, has forced me into a tighter and tighter box of people that are like-minded enough to where I can speak my mind. And I can't have... The, and I see that in the classroom. It, it, I was trained as a teacher thinking, okay, my job is to create a space where students can really disagree with each other, have it out, and do so in a reasoned, you know, respectful fashion. I thought that was the job of classroom management. It still happens, but what I notice more and more, especially at the undergrad level, is students... Do, They'll disagree, but then they don't even want to debate about it. It'll be much more like, oh, well, my perspective is this. I, I get that yours is that. Um, it's sometimes, yeah. yeah, they're scared. Exactly. Because they had, again, they haven't had that experience of, no, we can really hash it out. And not only will it be okay, we'll actually be better friends for it at the end. And I, my, my heart breaks about that because I don't know what or where I would be without those experiences in my life. I mean, the, yeah. my memories of doing that for better or for worse, they've made me what I am and who I am. So, um, I, th I, I think a lot about that now with my teaching, it's like, and I, and I guess what I try to do is to say, okay, we're, I, I don't always put it directly in these terms, but I think the vibe is, I get that you're scared, but we're going to do this. Like if you say this is your view, yeah. I'm going to ask. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about it, and I'm going to ask you to. Um, I'm going to invite you, but I'm to provide. You know, say more about it. Why do you think that? Who are you listening to? Who are your sources? And when it goes well, I think students then walk away having had something like that experience. Um, and when it doesn't go well, we deal with it. But I was to me, say, that's what we're, a lot we're of in the era of the feelings as facts and the safe spaces, mate. So. You know, you must have come up against that issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, teaching is not, the classroom is not a safe space, but it can be a human space. It can be a space yeah. of respect. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah. and I think, it, yeah. and maybe, and maybe I'm sure there are exceptions to this, but I think a lot of the peop people that come in saying, you know, safe space, safe, safe space, safe space, that's again a lot of times that's because they haven't experienced the other they haven't experienced like a, a space of bravery and human connection and vulnerability and so on and once they do whether it's with me or somewhere else in their life um i mean i i still believe in education's ability to sort of you know long after they've forgotten all of the specific facts and arguments that we're talking about i want them to remember the feeling of oh yeah I, I stood my ground. I I was forced to think critically about what I believe. Yeah. And I I put it forward and it was okay. And I learned something in the process, whether I walked away from that thinking exactly the same way that I did before or whether my mind has changed slightly. I want them to remember like at a at a deep level that feeling. Because yeah. I think that's what we need a lot more of. It'd be you know, no doubt. I, I I would love to sit in one of your classes. I've got to say, you'd be an excellent mentor for that reason alone. Um, but you know, I, I'm drawn just on the on the topic of on ideology. You know, we, we've got it here in Australia. It's not a it's a Western Hemisphere thing these days. It's not an American. Yeah. America just gets punished a lot in the Western media for this. But you know, this uh, you know, you got to you got two choices. That I'm talking about the two choices that you've got for the you were a presidential year. 
and you're smart enough to know that the American electoral uh, outcomes have a significant influence, say, on sure. Australia because we have American bases here. So we've got a significant military American military presence in Australia, as does Germany, for example. So my point is, is that America affects the rest of the world in ways that I don't think a lot of people in North America are understand or even aware. Yeah. Okay. So do you have a take or are you willing to, to, to what extent are you willing to talk about what's going on with the, the electoral process when we've got two people who, sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying this for both of us, are pretty bloody unpalatable. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is where, again, this is where sort of going deeper and not falling for the spectacle, I think, becomes yeah. really important, right? Like, um, I mean, the and the analogy, I, it's like you can watch sports, you know, and you can say, oh, I'm really invested in my team. And, you know, it's like I'm a, I'm a Steelers fan. So it's like, oh, oh if the Steelers win on Sunday, I'm going to be in a good mood on Monday if they don't and I'm not. I mean, that's fun. That's recreation, right? The problem becomes when that same basic mentality moves over into it's the complexities so of state. The same politics, yeah. right? It's like, oh, this is my team, you Absolutely. know. Um, yeah. As opposed to the, as opposed to saying, look, you know, this is, yeah, the the diagnosis you just gave. It's like within the American electoral system, and I was actually uh, a friend of mine is uh, another musician friend, this Australian. We were in London recently. We were talking about oh, the next, the, the next basis store, drama. yeah, 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 Lloyd, Lloyd yeah. Uh, Swanton, and, um. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about the Australian electoral system as a put, compared to America. And I mean, and I know yours is not perfect, but I actually do think you all have done a better job of sort of widening. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've sort of widened the widened the palette. You've widened the yeah. um, array of choices. Um, I think, and, and what you then get, and maybe this sounds oversimplistic, is that when it's always this choice of two teams, you know, Steelers versus Ravens, Republicans versus Democrats, you end up, um, it, it feeds this binary. Yeah. It, it feeds this binary to where all of a sudden it's, it's and, and the place, the place you see it is that people stop listening to each other and all they're listening for is code words. Yeah. Right. Like it's, oh, you just said, you just said inclusion. <laughs> you must be a crazy hippie lefty. Oh, you just said truths. You must be a, a radical conservative. You know, it's like everyone's just listening for the code words that are going to send them off on their yeah. And that's and that's a that's a thinking problem. But it also then then it becomes a technology problem because again then the algorithms take over yeah. and they and they um and so I think that until we. I think the United States really has a lot to learn about what it means to um, ins put in place structures that allow that will allow for a broader palette. We try to do that sometimes with third party stuff here, but you know that just yeah. doesn't. We're not the system is not built to allow that to gain traction. So um, it's yeah. I so my politics then just goes. I was talking about this the other day my politics really have become pretty hyper local to be honest. And I know that, I know that local doesn't touch, you know, nuclear war, you know, that <laughs> billions of dollars in four. Yeah. I mean, I know there are huge, huge issues that can't be worked out at the local, right. but I just, um, I'm like, start with your, start with your local school board, start with your local sheriff, start with your local co-op. Yeah. And try to, and I don't mean that in an isolationist way, like, you know, bunker up, you know, with 10, <laughs> 10 other preppers. I yeah. just mean, yeah, I, I, I think what I mean is don't, don't spend all your time on the spectacle <laughs> that doesn't really care about yeah. you. Spend time in the direct visceral connection that does care about you. Mm. And then maybe collectively we build up from there. I don't know. Some days I'm, some days I'm hopeful about it. Some days not. Yeah, I think I'm the same. Yeah, but you you made a really valid point, which is, I I, I I I've long said, or not long, you know, for the time duration of the podcast. Anyway, we do have a lot of political conversations, and I just most people are on the, you know, we're we're, we're it's not that we're somewhere in the middle, we're somewhere outside of it, looking at it and going, what the hell? How did we end up at this point? You I mean, 
you, you, this, this idea that you follow a political team, oh, I'm the blue team or the red team, like to your point, I'm a, yeah, West Tigers, rugby, your rugby league, you know, so they had a bloody yeah. night tonight and uh, lost <laughs> yeah. 60 to 12 or whatever it was. It's terrible. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And I think, well, it doesn't actually influence how I feel because I've got nothing to do with it. And and I've got to say, I feel a little bit like that with politics as well. But mm-hmm. a lot of people don't, most of the people that are active online, those people who you see having arguments, they don't feel that way. They think if I have this argument, I'm putting up the flag for my team and putting the stake in the ground and, and fuck you, you know. And it's how we... and, and how we how we lost and I know I know it was lost in America before it was lost here, but we've certainly arrived at the same point as as uh, you have in the United States. We're not cynical anymore toward politicians, and I don't know when that happened. And I'm really yeah I'm worried about that. That's a one yeah. Thing. That's that's no, that's well said. Um, I and cynicism and and cynicism to your point doesn't mean inaction. It doesn't mean, oh, and therefore I just don't participate at all. But it does mean irony, right? Like a healthy irony. It's like, look, pol- if politicians are not going to save you, they're not, they don't care about you directly. That doesn't mean that the political process itself doesn't have consequences. But yeah. if you're going to participate in politics, I think you're absolutely right. Participate. I would actually use a slightly different word. I think. I think I would say irony or a sense of skepticism as opposed to cynicism. Cynicism, I think, to me, that denotes kind of inaction. You know, it's like, oh, I'm just going to like be apathetic yeah. in the face of it. Right. I think what you're talking about, the way I would put it, not to wordsmith, but I think the way I would put yeah. it would be like, no, it's a healthy skepticism. It's a healthy, ironic distancing yeah. that allows us to, to, to act however we're going to act, you know, vote however you're going to vote or not, you know, do whatever, but don't invest this kind of false existential importance into it. Um, I do, I think two things happen in the United States around that. One is the the rhetoric shifted away from, I think my political opponent is wrong to, I think my political opponent is evil or like morally deficient. Yeah. And I, I feel like in my lifetime, I sort of saw that happen. And there, there are exceptions to this, but like it's it went from being, oh, we have really fundamental disagreements about X, Y, Z thing, you know, healthcare, war on terror, whatever, over into my opponent disagrees with me because he or she is evil. Like that's, and then that filters down into the citizenry, right? Like mm-hmm. we start to divide ourselves up the same way. I think I would also say theologically, it's like, just to put it over simply, like if you lose faith in the ultimate, you're going to invest the penultimate with a weight that it was never meant to carry, which really is the definition of idolatry. Yeah. Actually, we don't make idols out of things we know are evil or unimportant for the most part. Real idolatry comes when we take like a good thing or an important thing and we invest it with, we put it in a central place that uh, it wasn't designed to go in or we invest it with a kind of ultimate weight that it was never meant to carry. And I think politics, it's not as simple as to say that politics is serving as a proxy for religion. We'd have to you know complicate all that. But I do think, I I think I would say if people lose faith in sort of a, deep narrative of God or life or hope that I think one of the results is, um, you know, GK Chesterton said, you know, if someone stops believing in God, it's not that they believe in nothing. It's that they'll believe in anything. And, um, I think what I'm saying is kind of the way I would say that is the penultimate gets invested with the energy of the ultimate. And so I see politics, people are bringing religious fervor, to politics and politics was never meant to be a religion. I think we're also suffering and work with me here when I say this. Okay. Um, and it kind of links into what you're saying about the penultimate. I, it might, might be a bit controversial, particularly given your, your title and, and what you do, but I don't actually think you have to have a belief in God, but I think you have to have a belief in the belief in God. And I believe that's what we've suffered suffered through, and that's why people the whole idea of leave for Caesar what is for Caesar, and for God what is God, what what is God's, okay? And 
um, a lot of people, and the reason I say that you know to have a belief in God, just the belief in the belief in God, is a lot of I went, I was, I had to go to mass every Sunday. I have a very good innate understanding of my relationship with God because of that. Most people don't. I've, I've learned that don't have that. They didn't have that. They weren't. I was, I was brought up in a hardcore Irish Catholic household. Had to go to mass, all of the um, sacraments, including marriage in a Catholic church. Right up to that point, um, that that I've yeah, participated in. And um, my point is, is that most people that don't, they don't have that. They don't even know when I say sacrament. They don't know what that means. But mm. a lot of people still understand that they have a belief in God, but it's more of an agnostic perspective. But just in my conversations, people aren't even willing to acknowledge they're agnostic. And so when you when you remove God and you replace it, what are you going to replace it with? This is the point. And for yeah. a lot of people, that's politics. And I do believe this is just my theory. It is playing that role. I think I think absolutely. And and you know it's and the 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 system will will exploit that. The system will build on yeah. that. Right. You know I yeah. can't. I can't remember a presidential election in my lifetime where the line wasn't this is the election that will decide the future of the country. This is the this is the this is yeah. the election where everything's at stake. Everything's, everything's all on the line. Up to you. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like and you know, again, if you're if you've got sort of a healthy skepticism, you know, you roll your eyes and it's just like, Oh yeah, that's politician speak, you know, whatever. Um but if but if you've got this sort of a this sounds cheesy, but I mean, if you if you've got this sort of like God shaped hole, and it's like, okay, I'm looking for something yes. that, um, you know, this is a this is a side note, but I mean, I think about this. You know, the word passion. It um, we talk about being passionate about something. Passion also means suffering, right? In Latin, you know, the passion of the Christ. Yeah, I think. We talk as if people are looking for the thing that will bring them the most pleasure. I actually think that people are looking for the right things to suffer for. I, I think we've got that hardwired into us. It's like we have this sense, oh, to be truly human, to live a meaningful life is to suffer for the right things, to to strive and to struggle and wrestle for the right yeah. things. And... I think I think part of the reason why politics so easily fits that God-shaped hole and draws on it is to say, "Oh, we're not just promising you pleasure. We're we're asking for you to suffer for this. You know, you got to go out and you know be on the front lines, be a soldier for this, and so on." And I think that's a far more seductive message than say, I think it's the reason why I say like music fandom doesn't have quite the same draw. I'm not saying some people don't make you know their their rock star idols and their idols but i actually don't think that happens nearly as often as it does with politics why because for the most part entertainments and the promise of pleasure doesn't hook into those deeper kinds of energies that say i want to suffer for the right thing yeah. i want to be a kind of martyr for the right thing you know passion Boston, yeah in, in in that sense politics picks up on our passions um and you know there's a it's a whole other thing we could say, you know, in orthodoxy, passions are actually, actually name the negative energies that happen when we invest, when we do that idolatry thing, when we invest the penultimate with the ultimate. So in orthodoxy, we talk about overcoming the passions, not because the passions always point to bad things, but because our passions are our way of attaching ourselves inordinately too much to um, things that are not designed to carry that kind of weight. So I can be, so if I'm passionate about, well, I mean, let's take a really intense example. If I, if I think about my kids, you know, I'm called to love them. I'm called to suffer for them. I'm called to do it. But if I, if I make my kids the ultimate, not only is that wrong theologically, I'm really damaging my kids at that moment if mm. i if i truly say there is literally nothing more important than you and i will and i will always place you at the center of everything kids are not meant to bear that weight spouses are not meant, you know romantic yeah. partners are not meant to bear that weight you know um and you're really going to damage the thing if you try to put all of the weights of the ultimate upon the the penultimate thing 
And so overcoming the passions, I think means partly like overcoming that tendency to attach ourselves in an ultimate way to that, which is not ultimate. And again, I think politics is just designed to, uh, to, to, um, hook us exactly along those lines. Yep. Great summary. Look, I'll, um, I'll make this my final question for you and I'm going to bring it back to the book, of course. Okay. So what are your aspirations for the book? What do you hope happens from here? Well, the main thing is that it gets out into paperback, so it becomes affordable. <laughs> That's uh, I'm told that it will come out in paperback in, a, yeah. in about a year or so. So, um, so if you're listening to this and you're intrigued by the book, you know, get it. It's it's crazy expensive right now, but it's it should be at libraries or whatever. If you, um, but what I hope it does is that it. It keeps this conversation going around some of the things that we've talked about saying, uh, well, like sitting here right now, I, 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 you've really picked up on something that I was hoping readers would pick up on is that it's not just this bait and switch kind of thing. It's, it's more that because re- religions are living vital things, people come into it in certain ways. And then that, keeps going in ways that can either transform something towards the better or can potentially deform it into mm-hmm. something less good. And I think death to the world is sits right at that intersection of something that means a, a lot to a lot of people. And it is one example of how you can carry that forward in a way that really creates ongoing intense connection with God, with the divine, mm-hmm. with, with truth. Or that can get caught up in all of these kinds of dynamics that we're talking about, you know, the algorithms, the outrage, the culture wars, the, the everything, to where that same kind of energy gets channeled in a negative way. I hope people, I hope people, if they read the book, I hope that intrigues them. And then I hope they start seeing that in lots of other places and they get curious about, okay, what does it mean for this energy to be get channeled the right way as opposed to, um, as opposed to the wrong way. And then we get more people, we get more books, more, more okay. conversation about all the other kinds of places where that happens. If that happens, I'd be super excited to have played a tiny part in it. Yeah. Yeah, I want to thank you finally for participating in, in the two conversations that we've had, because it's the direction that I really, it's, I want to add more conversations like this. Of course, we will talk again, no doubt. But sure. you know, my audience is, isn't stupid, and I don't, I don't treat them that way at all. Like, you know, there's this whole bloody thing with, ex- with, with extreme metal is a bit different. It does attract a different type of person. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, heavy metal is in music for idiots or what have you. I, I've never treated my audience that way. And I can tell you that the podcast audience in particular really hooked into our last chat. And I even, just to give you this bit of feedback, um, you know, I'm good mates with um, Jamie from Demi Borgir. And he told me our, our chat was the, the best episode I'd ever released on the show. Wow. To, wow. That's, so that's to give you an idea man, yeah. who, we're, who we're getting through to and the sort of people that it's resonating with, mate, it's actually working. So... You know the work you're doing and the sort of conversations that we're willing to have, mate. They are resonating, and that's that's really important. Wow, they, uh, that's that's awesome. And yeah, I I always love our chats, you know, on and on and off the record. So let's keep it going. Thanks for everything that you're doing. Radio, there you go. Another worthy conversation with my mate from Indianapolis, Robert Saylor, theologian, author, and scholar. I really enjoy these chats, actually, with Robert, and I hope to do many more with him and with others as well. If you are or if you know an academic that would like to come onto the show and talk about their book, hit me up. It's just another string to the bow that makes up the the quiver. Is that the right way of describing it? You know what I'm trying to get at. It's just something that expands the horizons of the show. There you go. All right. My name is Andrew McKay-Smith and I'm the host of Scars and Guitars. Until the next one, it's a very good bye for now.